several weeks now, we've seen Robert Spillane come on to the dime defense and Devin Bush go off the field. Keith Butler addressed that yesterday, and as you can tell, I'm still laughing. Good morning to you. Good Wednesday morning, I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Steelers. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into hockey and or baseball. I also offer up Daily Shots of Penguins and Pirates right where you found this. The Steelers had their final practice of the bye week, it turns out, yesterday on the south side. The initial expectation was that they would practice both yesterday and today. Mike Tomlin canceled the practice for today so that his players will get not just the four days that are mandated by the labor agreement to be off, but five days in a row. Uh, No doubt a reward for what's undoubtedly been uh, an extraordinary effort, no matter what you think of the result at times. This team has certainly uh, given it all in terms of, you know, how hard it's played. The day also offered a final chance to speak with Tomlin, both of the coordinators, some players, and any time the coordinators are available, it's not a close call, you know, as to who's going to be more interesting. Uh, Matt Canada has been about as dry as you can get, and... Butler is just Butler. He is dadgum awesome when it comes to his communications because he doesn't really have a filter. He's just not equipped with one. So no matter what it is that you bring up with him, no matter how touchy the topic, you'll recall when he was asked about T.J. Watt's ongoing contract talks and he said something like, I'm with T.J., Meanwhile, it's Art Rooney signing his checks, and they made sure he never did that again. But in this case, yesterday, his session opened up with a line of questioning about Spillane's role and the inside linebackers. And here's what he had to say specifically about Spillane being part of the dime defense. Spillane Spillane has done a good job for us in in, uh, third-down situations. A lot of times when we want to uh, run some stunts up front with him, he, he does a, a, a good job of that. He got a good feel for the timing of uh, when we want him to blitz and faking blitzing sometimes. He's been around here, you know, as long as, uh, as any of those guys. So he knows a little bit more about it. And uh, some things, you know, he, some things he's a little bit better than they are. And some things they're, they're a little bit better than he is. So we try to fit them uh, here and there, but not, not necessarily run the same defenses uh, with the same guys all the time. Because you put a guy in, everybody says, oh, they're going to be in this, they're going to be in that. So we can't do that. But Splane does a good job and gives us, a, gives us a breather a little bit. Yep, so he does some things better than they do, meaning Bush and Joe Schobert, and they do some things better than he does. Oh, to have a time machine, to go back to that night. And you remember the night well because you were just as excited as everybody else was. And rightly so. And rightly so. Management had done something really bold. They moved up in the draft. They got the inside linebacker they felt was going to be the best guy in that draft. They were finally going to have their successor to Ryan Shazier. Whether or not it was going to be him or Devin White, that didn't really come up all that much. It's just the whole sentiment at the time, you'll recall, was just get one of them. Get one of the Devons. And they did, and they traded up. And best of all, they used the draft picks that they'd gotten in what seemed like a real stinker of a trade involving Antonio Brown. So even that felt better. And it was just all good. And here was going to come this, I was going to say generational, not generational. Nobody laid that on Devin Bush, but He was seen as an impact splash type player for a modern NFL defense, which is what Shazier was 
before his time, you'll remember when he came out of Ohio State, everyone looked at him and was like, he's got to be a safety. He's got to be a safety. No, no, no. Inside linebackers are going to have to cover in the modern NFL. And, of course, Shazier ended up kind of crafting the position in his own image because that's how good he was. So we were all excited. This is great. Wow. This is, wow. This is just, this is the solution to everything. This defense was already going to be really good, and now it was going to get, you know, some other version of Ryan Shazier. And here we are. Here we are talking about how Robert Spillane is a better fit in the dime defense. This portion of Daily Shot of Steelers is brought to you by Point Park University. Choose from nearly 100 career-focused programs leading to bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees. Choose when and how you prefer to do that studying, whether it's at Point Park's downtown Pittsburgh campus, whether it's online, maybe a flexible hybrid format works best for you. Find out more about all of this at pointpark.edu. I am not here to bury the career of Devin Bush. I'm not. I will both recognize and respect that he is coming back from a major knee surgery. And to underscore that, I will point out and remind that Zach Banner, who is coming back from the same injury, from the same timeline, bigger dude, so there are additional complications, but he still isn't even on the field. He had a setback in training camp, but Bush could have had a setback in training camp. Didn't. So Bush is playing. Bush is out there in the process of regaining who and what he is. And I think we can all agree that upon watching Bush in the preseason games especially, that he didn't have his full step. He wasn't who he was before that surgery and that he was going to get exposed. But now, here we are. Six full weeks into the season, the Steelers not only have had to adjust for Bush, but they go out and they make, I guess you could call it a last-minute acquisition of Schobert from the Jaguars, certainly late in the offseason. He comes in and has to learn the system like that. And they're still left with Spillane as their dime guy. Spillane, who, God love him. You talk about the effort that I was citing before. Spillane's at the top of that list. Nobody outworks, outruns, outtrucks that guy in terms of giving it his all. Ask Derrick Henry about that. But if you're talking about him as your dime linebacker for anything other than the purpose of like uh, being excessively clever in terms of disguising your defense, you're talking about a real, can I use the word failure after week six? I think so. We're talking about a real failure at inside linebacker at that position. Butler got a little bit defensive yesterday whenever it was brought up that you know these guys, the inside linebackers, weren't making a whole lot of tackles in that third quarter Sunday against Seattle when the Seahawks were just gashing right up the gut. You know, unapologetically, just boom, 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 boom. And Butler said something about how some of that was on the defensive front, which I'm sure it was. The fact of the matter is when all of your leading tacklers on the day end up being your safeties. I mean, you've done something really wrong when the other team doesn't even have its quarterback and was afraid to throw the football. You've done something really wrong. Bush wasn't tackling. Schobert wasn't tackling. Spillane, he tackles, but, you know, again, this isn't the most mobile individual in the league. And I think what you're seeing here is Spillane is being utilized because he's not making mental mistakes, which he isn't. Butler confirmed that yesterday. He's more cognizant of when to blitz and how to blitz, even though he very rarely does blitz. 
at least that option is there for the coaching staff. And he's just getting the job done better than those other two guys are. That's a failure. Those are both of your players. I don't mean to leave Schobert out of this. I'm not throwing him in here parenthetically. I haven't been impressed. And I said this when I first laid eyes on him. And it was a pretty unpopular opinion because we all got our hopes up. Hope is a big thing. Never rain on hope. You know, worst thing you can do in my business, rain on hope. But I had my hopes up, and you said this guy. Well, you just call it like whatever it is that you see it. You don't worry about whose feelings you're hurting or whose hopes you might be quashing. Schobert didn't show me anything right off the bat. He still hasn't. When he was acquired, we were all singing about this really high number of interceptions that he had, in particular with Cleveland when he was a Pro Bowl selection. And I had someone who I I know and trust pretty well in Jacksonville, happens to be a subscriber to DK Pittsburgh Sports, who works for the Jaguars, who reached out to me and said, this guy, whatever it is that you're thinking, no. Okay? That, That Joe Schobert was in the past. This position, inside linebacker, is a real problem. And unlike a lot of the other positions that we talk about with the Steelers that need to be fixed up, I don't see where it happens here. What do you do? Just get Buddy Johnson in the mix all of a sudden? What do you do? You know, these guys just have to play better. Bush and Schobert need to be better. Sure, it'll help if you have, you know, Stefan Tuitt and other guys up front taking away some of the responsibility that they have to shoulder with, you know, gasp, tackling. That really shouldn't have to be the case. You're an inside linebacker in the National Football League. You've got to be able to bring down a running back. When we come back, just one question. Accidents who need help with workers' comp or medical malpractice claims. The attorneys at LGKG pride themselves in doing what they say they're going to do. It's important to them that when they make you a promise, they keep it. This law firm has been keeping promises in our region for over 80 years. Learn more about them at LGKG.com or by calling 888-842-5454. Our J1Q today comes from Germany comes from Rick in Germany, who asks, I don't get all the angst about the defense that I'm reading and hearing. (laughs) Well, Rick, sorry about that first segment then. But continuing with Rick's question, is this just a matter of the stats versus the eye test not lining up? Or that a backup quarterback was at the helm for Seattle and the expectations were higher? Was this spectacular? No, but other than two drives in the third quarter, the defense was very good. The defense allowed 209 yards passing, adjusted to 165 with sacks. And that's not great, but it would fall into the top five league-wide versus yards per game passing defense. That sounds good, Rick. And you singled out the one thing that Seattle didn't even try to do. Uh, You know, Butler acknowledged yesterday, whenever he was asked, that the Seahawks really flipped things up on them. Uh, you know, you, you can't call that all the time on third down. Sometimes you got to call it on second down. Sometimes you got to call it on first down. They ran on third down. You know, if you see what they did in the second half, they or, or might have been the first. They ran on third down. Oh, this is third and seven. It wasn't like this day on third and two or something like that. So they ran the ball on us, and uh, they tried to mix it up coming back and uh, tried to give their, their quarterback a, a little bit of a breather, I think. So uh, and, and keep him from uh, getting behind and us be able to uh, get pressure on him. And that's okay. Teams make adjustments. The Seahawks made a terrific one at the half. Even they couldn't have thought it would work out as well as it did, but it did. I'm going to respectfully disagree with you that it was only about two drives because I saw the Seahawks continue to run the ball effectively. The only time the Seahawks got themselves into any kind of trouble offensively in the second half at all, was when they were naive enough to think that they could just 
put the game back in Gino's hands. That was nuts. That was nuts. What were they doing trying to pass the ball there? That's not anything that the Steelers did well. That was just plain old dumb. So I'm not... Look, you could have a game that your team wins by 40, okay? And I'm talking about at any level of football, right down to that youth league in Bloomfield that I see off Liberty Avenue on a regular basis. You could have any scenario in football that is successful from your side, and if you get gashed running the football, if you get gashed, it's an L. It is a big L. There are a lot of things that have changed about this beautiful game over the decades. That is not one of them. Not just because of culture or machismo or whatever, but it's because it's a helpless, pathetic feeling when it happens. That is absolutely how this should be taken, not just by us on the outside, but especially on the inside. That word gashed, by the way, T.J. Watt used it himself after the game Sunday. That's not lightly thrown around. That is not a positive term to have associated with your defense, whether it's for two drives or a full quarter or a full half, however it is that you want to portray it or that I want to portray it. That is not a negative spin, positive spin thing. They got gashed by another team's number three and number four running backs while that team was also missing its running quarterback. Wow. Just no. There's no reason to paint that in any kind of positive way. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Steelers. We will do it again tomorrow.